Today we're going to look at some selected diffraction problems. So to review, we have previously derived the Fresnel diffraction formula that says that the output field, G2 of X and Y, is related to the input field by We've got a phase factor, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d over i lambda d. And then a convolution integral between the input field, g1 of psi and eta, and e to the i pi over lambda d, x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared d psi d eta. So here we think of this as the output of our linear system and the g1 as the input. So we want to look at some different inputs and calculate what the outputs will be. And of course, these are a function of x and y, but also of the distance d. And we also saw that if the input field, g1 of x and y, is identically equal to zero for a radial distance r, which is the square root of x squared plus y squared, greater than some radius a, and if d is much, much greater than a squared over lambda, which is equivalent to saying that d over a is much, much greater than a over lambda. In other words, the distance to the output field measured in apertures is much greater than the aperture measured in wavelengths. If that's true, then we are in the far field. And the Fresnel formula reduces to the Fraunhofer formula, which says that G2 of X and Y is equal to the same terms out in front, e to the i 2 pi over lambda d over i lambda d, but the uh, integral reduces to a quadratic phase factor e to the i pi over lambda d x squared plus y squared, and then the angular spectrum of the input, big G of 1, evaluated at u is equal to x over lambda d, and v is equal to y over lambda d. And so that is the far field or Fraunhofer diffraction formula. Now we're going to imagine these input fields as being generated as follows. Here's the z-axis and here is the x-axis and we have a normally incident unit amplitude plane wave that is a plane wave e to the i 2 pi over lambda z incident on the uh, z is equal to zero plane in which we have some aperture. We have a screen in that plane and that aperture is defined by some transmittance function t of x and y and so the field immediately after that screen will be, well, e to the i 2 pi over lambda z at z is equal to 0, which is equal to 1 times the transmittance. So your g1 of x and y will simply be equal to the transmittance function. And then we are interested in the output out here at some distance d away. And of course, we have to calculate the effect of the diffraction um, to get us the output at z is equal to d. So, our input field, G1 of X and Y, will simply be the transmittance function of this screen. And that is the most common way to generate these different uh, input fields. <laughs>
When talking about diffraction, a useful parameter is the Fresnel number. And this is F is equal to A squared over lambda D. Now, this comes from the fact that in the Fresnel diffraction formula for the X dependence, there is a factor E to the I pi over lambda D times X minus Psi squared. And if you're looking at the diffracted field on the Z axis where X is equal to zero, then this becomes E to the I pi over lambda D Psi squared. And so looking at that in the input plane, the uh, Psi eta plane, or Psi, and let's just look at the real part of this, which would be the cosine pi over lambda d psi squared. It might look something like this. So this would be uh, cosine pi over, or let's write it this way actually, cosine of pi times psi squared over lambda d. Uh, now that phase would be, of course, zero here at psi is equal to zero. Then when you get to a certain value of psi, so that psi squared over lambda d is equal to one, then the phase will become pi, and that would be right down here. And then you would go through another, so this would be one pi of phase change. And then when you get to the point where this is two pi, well then this is up here, you got two pi of phase change, and then three pi would be there and et cetera. And then likewise over here, it's the same thing because it's a function of psi squared, so it's an even function. So then there's one, two, and three. Now, imagine that your input is zero, so this is the idea that g1 of x and y is identically zero for um, r greater than a, then along the psi axis, let's suppose that uh, this was our a, and over here was our minus a. Then we would say, in this case, the Fresnel number, a squared over lambda d, well, that would just be this factor evaluated at the edge of the field. And so that would then tell you uh, that that would be the number of pi phase changes from the origin to the edge of the field. So this would be a case, if this was our A, this would be a case of an F is equal to three. A squared over lambda D, well that's just psi squared over lambda D evaluated at psi is equal to A, and that would just be here zero, one, two, three pi phase changes, so F is the number of pi phase changes from psi is equal to zero to, so from on the optical axis to psi is equal to A at the edge of the field. Now we know that the near field we've defined as d much, much less than a squared over lambda. And if we put these together to form the Fresnel number, we see that that is the case where f is much, much bigger than one. a squared over lambda d would be much, much bigger than one. That means that in the near field, there are many, many of these pi phase changes. On the other hand, in the far field, D is much, much greater than A squared over lambda, which implies that F is much, much less than one. So in the far field, there is much less than pi of phase change. In fact, that was how we defined the far field. We said it's the distance you have to move. So basically this phase uh, is essentially 
very close to zero. So this is just e to the zero is equal to one. So we can neglect that quadratic phase that looked like this. So now we see it in terms of this Fresnel uh, parameter. And an interesting kind of intermediate point would be when we get to this point here, what would that be? Well, let's see, this would be, that's one pi phase change. This is pi over two of phase change. So that would correspond, if our aperture was that wide, that would correspond to f is one half. And that is the point at which if we, from that point on, as we go farther away, there is never um, this, the real part of this e to the i pi over lambda d psi squared, cosine pi psi squared over lambda d, is never negative. Right? For, for um, when you get into bigger values of, of f, of course you, go, you have positive and negative, so you get some destructive interference in this integral. Once you hit f as one half and then smaller values of f, you never have that destructive interference effect. And we'll see um, what that implies for the field once you get past d large enough that f is one half or less. So f less than or equal to one half will say no. destructive interference. Now, another thing, and we talked about this uh, in a previous lecture, that when, especially when numerically calculating diffraction, um, it is convenient to use units in which the wavelength is equal to one. Take the wavelength as your unit of length. And so if in those units you say, for example, d is equal to 4, then if you want to convert things to SI units, you would say d is equal to 4 times the wavelength. So if the wavelength is 1 micron, then, then d is equal to 4 corresponds to d is equal to 4 microns, and etc. But this normalizes things to the wavelength. And in general, in electromagnetics problems, and certainly in diffraction problems, Everything scales with the wavelength. So if I have a problem uh, that's operating with a wavelength of one half micron, roughly around green light, and I get some certain results, if I then go and do the same problem with a wavelength that is one half a centimeter, I will get exactly the same results provided all the other geometry in my problem scales up by that same factor of one centimeter over one micron. So this is very convenient in basically normalizing things to a unit wavelength because then we've solved problems at all possible scales. So our first example will be diffraction by a circular aperture. And you can see some of the results down here at the bottom of the screen. So this is the case where your input field, g1 of x and y, is a circ function. Circ r over a, where a is the radius of the aperture, and r, of course, is just the radial distance, square root of x squared plus y squared. And this looks like a circle. So you got a clear aperture with it inside a circle of radius A, and outside, you've got an opaque screen. If you want to talk about the diameter, well, the diameter is just two times the radius, of course. All right, so down here, uh, we've got some results for the case A is equal to 4. Again, that's would mean four wavelengths. We're using units in which the wavelength is our unit of distance. Or if you want to talk about the diameter, that would be eight wavelengths. And these are distances of one quarter wavelength, one, four, 16, and 64 wavelengths. The corresponding Fresnel numbers just go in the opposite order. 64, 16, 4, 1, and a quarter. 
So here with a Fresnel number of 64, well, that's much, much less than, uh, much, much greater than one, sorry. And so we're in the near field here. And so you see that the diffractive field looks, you know, basically like the aperture. Now, as we go to greater distances, smaller Fresnel numbers, we still keep more or less the same. Uh, the illuminated area is primarily equivalent or coincides with the aperture. But now these, there's some little ripples in here and they'll start getting bigger. And that's as the Fresnel number gets smaller, we've got, the, we've got less uh, radical um, destructive interference in that integral. We've got fewer cycles of the, the phase, of the quadratic phase factor. And now here we hit uh, f is equal to 1, and then we pass over f is 1 half into f is equal to a fourth. And from that point on, we'll see a video in a, in a moment, um, the field basically then stops changing and just starts expanding, and that's going into the far field. And in fact, we can calculate the far field analytically because we know the Fourier transform of a circ function is equal to, uh, using the scaling theorem, that would be a squared, vessel function, the first type, j1, 2 pi, a rho over a rho, where rho is radial distance in the spatial frequency domain, square root of u squared plus v squared. And when we plug that into the Fraunhofer diffraction formula, then that would be r over lambda d. And so this here is the far field pattern. And it doesn't change. It still has, always has the same mathematical form and just simply expands as d increases. So the for a point where you would have a fixed value of this field, r would expand linearly with d. So let's look at uh, an animation that just shows the evolution of this diffracted field as d increases. So here is our aperture. Again, it's a, a radius of four wavelengths, diameter of eight wavelengths. And we're going to jump immediately to a distance of d is 1.6, and then follow the diffraction pattern all the way out to d is equal to 160. So there is it, 1.6. You see as you go farther and farther away, the distance between these peaks and valleys gets bigger and bigger. Eventually, the whole pattern basically is stationary and just expands. So let's look at that again. So you see these little uh, layers basically peeling off there. And then you see, you'll see kind of the central region sort of start to grow, but then a layer will peel off and then it'll bump back down to its previous radius until you get to the final layer, which comes right there. Now that now you're at the Fresnel number is equal to a half. Those layers come from those uh, interference fringes, basically the positive and negative deviations of the e to the i pi over lambda d um, x minus psi squared. And once you hit a Fresnel number of a half, there are no more positive and negative oscillations. And then the whole pattern just starts to grow. And now you're going entering into the far field. Next up is a rectangular aperture. So in this case, G1 of X and Y is a product of two rect functions, rect of X over W times rect of Y over H. And that would look something like this. So here is W, the width, and H, the height. Obviously, if W and H were equal, then this would be a square. And so that's your clear aperture. And then everywhere outside, you have an opaque screen. 
And we'll look at this, uh, these values, uh, uh, images down here correspond to the values of W is equal to eight, eight wavelengths, and H is equal to half of that, four. So we start off with the same DNF values, uh, one fourth, one, one up by a factor of four each time, four, 16, 64, and the F numbers, 64, 16, 4, 1, and 1 fourth. So we start off with basically what looks like the, uh, the aperture. Uh, there's some very fine little detail in there, but as the F uh, Fresnel number drops down, you, that uh, detail grows, and you start to see this uh, interior structure. Now we get to F is equal to 4, and now the rectangle is starting to blur out a bit. And you also see in these kind of side lobes, which we know will eventually become in the far field, the side lobes of the sink functions. Now at F is equal to one, you can see very clearly those sink function side lobes forming, the spacing is getting larger and the rectangle is blurred even more. And then as we get to F is equal to a fourth at a distance of 64, now the rectangle started out twice as wide as it was high and when we start to get into the far field that's inverted it's now twice as high as it is wide at least the uh, the diffraction pattern is and we can understand that by looking at the angular spectrum of the input field big g1 of u and v so we use the scaling theorem and the fact that a rect Fourier transforms to a sink and so this will become well, well, from the scaling theorem, we'll get factors of W and H, and then we'll get, for the X, we'll get sync W, U, and in Y, we'll get sync H, V. And with U is equal to X over lambda D, W, U will be W, X over lambda D. And we know the, the width of a sync function is one, the change in its argument of about one is the, defines the width. So if this is the argument and we set that equal to one, uh, then we can solve for X would be lambda D over W. And likewise doing the same thing in the Y dimension, we would have Y would be lambda D over, in that case, H. So this is, as you get into the far field, this is why the pattern grows linearly with distance. Uh, say a particular value of x and y that corresponds to a constant value of these sync functions will then scale linearly with distance. And you can also see why we go from an original rectangle which was twice as wide as it is high to a far field pattern which is right here which is twice as high as it is wide it's because in the far field now your dependence is inverse with respect to the W and the H. So if W is very large here, um, then one over that is going to be relatively small. And likewise, if H is relatively small, one over H is relatively large. And so this is a general characteristic of diffraction. Dimensions which are very wide in the input plane as you get out into the far field become relatively narrow and dimensions which are relatively narrow in the input plane become relatively wide. So now let's take a look at uh, a video of uh, this field evolving. Let's start by looking at the more symmetric case of a square. So width and height are both eight in this case, eight wavelengths. Uh, and by the way, these diffracted fields are in false color. Of course, we were just looking at an amplitude, so there's no inherent color in that, but the false color allows us to see uh, smaller values of the field more clearly. Okay, and we'll jump right out to a distance uh, of 1.6 wavelengths. As you recall from our discussion of numerical solution of the Fresnel diffraction integral, when you have very, very short distances, well, that
pi over lambda d factor becomes very, very big, and it means you get lots and lots of phase change uh, in integrating over the aperture, and that becomes more and more problematic numerically. So we'll jump out to a, a more feasible distance of 1.6, and then we'll follow the diffracted field all the way to d is equal to 160 wavelengths. We obviously lack the spherical symmetry of the circular aperture. Um, so now we have definite structure in X and Y. And I notice that we hit a point there at which the kind of the evolution of the, of the structures basically stopped and then the whole thing just started to expand. That's when we get down below a Fresnel number of a half. Look at that again. So, go back here. Notice that in this region, more or less that central uh, lobe there maintains roughly the same size. And then suddenly, bam, you hit a point and now it starts to grow linearly with distance. And we're getting into the far field. Now let's look at a rectangle that is with eight height four. And now we'll see that kind of crossover where the widest dimension becomes the narrowest and vice versa. And there we go. Watch that again. Again, starting at a distance of 1.6 wavelengths. For a while, we, we more or less maintain the shape of the aperture and now we're getting into a region where now the it's growing more in height than in width and right about there you see right there when we get the f number it's about a half and we go down below that we're suddenly bonk there it starts to grow more or less linearly with distance and we move into the far field Now let's look at an annulus. And an annulus is a difference of two circ functions. So G1 of R, our input field, is circ of R over A minus circ of R over B, where A is greater than B. And so what that looks like is we've got an outer circle of radius A and an inner circle of radius B. And inside that circle of radius B, well, you've got the circ function R over A is 1 and the circ R over B is 1, so the difference is 0, and that becomes opaque. And then, of course, outside both circ functions, everything is opaque. So it looks something like this. And here down below, using the same D and F values as we have previously, 1 fourth, 1, 4, 16, 64, and then Fresnel numbers going in the opposite order, 64, 16, 4, 1, and 4th. Here we see very much in the near field, there is our annulus. And by the way, this, these uh, dimensions here are uh, 16 by 16 in the output plane. So there is our annulus. So it's, uh, there's no field essentially inside that inner circle and only significant field in between the two circles. And then as we start to diffract, notice what happens, the, that inner void starts to fill up. And eventually, out here, at t is equal to 16, or Fresnel number of 1, that becomes the brightest point in the diffraction pattern. That's that Arago spot phenomenon that we talked about in a previous lecture. Roughly, the whole structure remains more or less of the same size until we then now get down below a Fresnel number of about a half, and then it starts to grow as we increase the distance. 
and it starts to get wider and wider, these different lobes. And eventually we get into this far field structure, which then just simply grows linearly with distance. And that far field is, well, it's just a difference of Fourier transforms of two circ functions with different dimensions. So the first will be A over lambda d. Now we're instead of writing this in terms of u and v, we're just going to write it in terms of the actual um, spatial dimensions so that uh, the row is r over lambda d. So it'll be that times j1 of 2 pi a r over lambda d over a r over lambda d and then minus the same thing uh, and this should be an a squared sorry with a b instead of an a j1 of 2 pi b r over lambda d over b r over lambda d magnitude of that and that is that pattern right there and you can see we're getting pretty close to that here at a Fresnel number of a quarter and then we end up with this uh stationary pattern that just remains and then just grows larger and larger. And of course, it uh, decreases in amplitude as 1 over the distance. And then in power, that would be 1 over the distance squared, which is the typical 1 over r squared type of decrease of field strength uh, emitted from a finite aperture. Now let's change things up and look at two circular apertures and this will then be described by two offset circular functions we'll have circ of square root of x plus s over 2 squared plus y squared so that's the radial distance from a point offset minus s over 2 along the x-axis, and then a radius of a, and then plus circ square root of x minus s over 2 squared plus y squared. So that's a radius offset plus s over 2 on the x-axis divided by some radius b. And this would look something like this if there is the origin here's one circle over here and another circle over here so this circle has a radius a and this circle has a radius b and they have a center to center separation of s and of course everywhere outside those is opaque and down here we get the, uh, the diffraction simulation results. So here is at a distance of a fourth, one, four, 16, and 64, and Fresnel numbers going in the opposite order. Oops, and a fourth. So for um, very close in, a very large Fresnel number, we're in the near field, you see the two, um, circular apertures and see the simulated situation was a is equal to 2 b is equal to 1 and s is equal to 5 so that's the situation here um, dimensions of 16 by 16 for the output field so there's not much interaction between uh, those two fields as you move away they start to spread out a little bit uh, you're still in the near field there for those but um, as they start to spread out and overlap now you start to see interference fringes forming between those two patterns and then the farther you go go away those interference fringes grow in size and eventually you just see these uh, interference fringes overlaid on a uh, typical um, j1 over of r over r type of diffraction pattern for a circular disk. And here is the far field 
pattern. So, in the far field, the amplitude of the field would be, well, we would have, in this case, we have to use the scaling theorem because of the A and B, and also the shift theorem because of the plus S over 2 and minus S over 2. So the first circ would have a Fourier transform, which would be A squared over lambda D, J1 of 2 pi AR over lambda D over AR over lambda D. And now because of the shifting, remember that if you shift, in this case, you'd be shifting minus S over 2, so shifting to the left. So you would add a factor of E to the minus I 2 pi uh, S U, uh, but the shift uh, is actually S over 2, so the, the 2 of the 2 pi goes away, and you get E to the minus I pi S and then the u is, is x, sorry, x over lambda d. And for the second circ, you'd get plus b squared over lambda d, j1, 2 pi b r over lambda d over b r over lambda d, and now this shift is in the opposite direction, so it'd be e to the plus i pi sx over lambda d, magnitude of that. And so it's these shift um, terms, factors, that will give you then this interference, which will be fringes in the x direction, so left and right. Of course, if we had shifted the two circles up and down, then we would get fringes that would go up and down. So let's look at an animation of this. So here we have two circular openings, one with a radius of two, the other with a radius of one. They're separated by seven. That's so all measurements in wavelengths. And we're going to jump right in to a distance of 1.6 wavelengths and then follow the development of the diffraction pattern out to 160. So as the diffracted field uh, progresses, each of the circular patterns give off these rings as characteristic of the Bessel function J1, 2 pi, R over R kind of behavior. But when they start to overlap, then you're going to see interference fringes forming here. So like down here, you can see that you don't, instead of just uninterrupted circles, you're getting these broken bits because of the interference between those two patterns. And those are the e to the plus or minus i pi uh, s r over lambda d uh, I'm sorry, Sx over lambda d factors that will eventually prevail in the far field. And now as we move into the far field, just the uniform pattern starts to propagate and grow as we get farther and farther away from uh, the original aperture. And here we have some experimental results. So this was the aperture, uh, a large pinhole and a smaller pinhole. And a laser beam was collimated to produce a, essentially a plane wave that illuminated this. So this is in the very near field. This is now moving farther away, not, not yet in the far field, because you can see the, the two distinct circular patterns, but kind of in that intermediate region where they're, the different rings are starting to overlap. And if you look down here, um, and in, by the way, in this case, um, the dimensions were quite a bit different. Uh, each of these pinholes were some few hundreds of wavelengths in diameter, and the separation was uh, a few thousand wavelengths. So very different dimensions. Uh, and out here, you see in this overlapping region, these very fine interference fringes that are 
in the x direction back and forth along the axis joining the two original uh, circular apertures now if we, we went much farther uh, which would have been the far field in this case would have been well off of the optical table in the laboratory uh, these would have eventually merged together as we saw in that simulation and you would have had just one big blob there with these growing uh, in size interference fringes in the x dimension now let's look at the double slit arrangement and this is a classical aperture for demonstrating the concept of interference so here the input field is the sum of two recs and we can factor that out as an x dependence it looks like this rect of x minus s over 2 over w plus rect of x plus s over 2 over w so that offset in x direction as we had with the two circles uh, and then times rect y over h and this will look something like this where this is the height h um, each of these Rectangles has a width W, and the center to center separation is S. And of course, everywhere else is opaque. So here's what we see for the simulated diffraction pattern developing. Again, the same uh, distances one quarter, one, four. 16 and 64 and Fresnel numbers running in the opposite sequence there so here very much in the near field we have the two slits as we start to move away we get some diffraction off of each of them now the diffraction develops most rapidly in the dimension that is the narrowest and that would be the x dimension you see see this start to come off there uh, and as we get out now, here's a Fresnel number of four. The diffraction patterns have spread out quite a bit in the X dimension, but almost none at all in the Y dimension, in the larger dimension. And now here we get to a Fresnel number of one. And what's happening here is that these two, um, basically the sync functions that will develop from the Rex in X are starting to overlap. And now we're seeing the effects of the phase offsets due to those shifted uh, rect functions, the e to the plus or minus i pi s uh, x over lambda d patterns. And then eventually we get out here and start moving into the far field, and we see then just the interference fringes. And notice that the pattern now in the y dimension, which was originally the largest dimension uh, for the rects, is now relatively narrow and so then out into the far field we end up with this pattern so let's write down what that uh, diffraction pattern would be so the magnitude of g2 of x and y okay so it would be well we're going to have a sink in x and a sink in y and we we'll use the scaling theorem so we'll get a factor of w times h because we have two rects here we get 2wh um, over lambda d sink wx over lambda d and then from the y rect we get another sink and that will be h y over lambda d and then from the two terms uh, e e to the plus or minus i pi s x over lambda d and when you add the positive i and the negative i terms together you get two times the cosine of pi s x over lambda d and that is what describes these interference fringes that we see the very 
fine interference fringes. And so, if we look at the spacing here between these, Well, right, th this is a uh, magnitude, so one of these will be a, uh, a peak, and another will be a valley, and so that will correspond to a change of pi in phase of this cosine, and so that would correspond to a change in x, such that this term would change by 1, which would mean that the delta x would be lambda d over s. And of course, as d increases, uh, that spacing would increase as we see developing here in this sequence. It's inversely proportional to the separation of the two slits. So slits that are very far apart will create uh, uh, diffraction interference fringes, which are very close together, and vice versa. If these two slits were much closer together, then these diffraction uh, fringes would be much farther apart. So this situation that was simulated had w equals 1, so the uh, slits were of width 1 wavelength, height h is 8 wavelengths, and a separation of 7 wavelengths. Now we want to look at a very important uh, diffraction problem, that of a half plane. Now this is important for practical purposes and theoretical purposes. For practical purposes, um, so-called knife edge diffraction or half-plane diffraction comes up in the analysis of so-called path loss in radio communication systems in the case that the transmitter and receiving antenna uh, have obstructions between them. So it's very important in lots of applications, including wireless uh, networks and things like that. And then theoretically, it's very important because it's one of the few diffraction problems that can be solved exactly, where you can actually solve Maxwell's equations rigorously. So here is the geometry. There's the z-axis. Here's the, the x-axis. And on the x-axis, on the positive part of the x-axis, there is a mask but not on the negative part. So the negative part is clear, the positive part is masked, and we have a normally incident plane wave coming in, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda z, and that strikes uh, this mask. And so we then are interested in the field out here, um, either above the z-axis or below it, which we could describe by polar coordinates. Say this is a distance r and this is an angle theta. What we would expect from geometrical optics would be that this region down here for negative values of x would be illuminated, and the region above would be in shadow. Now what we'll see is that instead, of course, uh, the wave is going to diffract over into this shadow region, and you're going to not just have a field amplitude of 1 in the illuminated region and 0 in the shadow region. So our transmittance for this screen, everything uh, in the wide dimension, which comes out of the board, everything is uniform. So there's only dependence on x and y. The transmittance function is 0 for x greater than 0 and 1 for x less than zero. And then multiplied by this plane wave at z is equal to zero would just be your g uh, of x and y right after the screen would just be this function here. And according to geometrical optics, if that was valid, in other words, if we were essentially in the near field for all values of z, then our g of x and y and z greater than zero, so after the screen, would be, what would be zero for x greater than zero, and for x less than zero down in the illuminated region, it would just be a truncated version of this plane wave, e to the i, two pi over lambda z. That would be for x less than zero. Uh, 
Now that would be the limit that lambda goes to zero. Now, if lambda is not going to zero, well, then we're going to have some diffraction and we're going to get something a little more complicated than this. So this would also tell us that our g1 of x and y would be just equal to the t of x and y, which would be zero for x greater than zero and one for x less than zero. And that's here in the uh, z is equal to zero plane. And therefore, our Fresnel diffraction formula says g2 of x and y, somewhere out here, we want to know g2 of x and y. Well, that would be our vectors in front, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda d, over i, lambda d, and then the integral over the y dimension from minus infinity to infinity, and then the effect of the screen and hence of the input field being zero for x greater than zero would be that the integral in the x dimension would go from minus infinity and then stop at zero. And so then in the place where it's non-zero, it would just have a value of one. And then we would have from the Fresnel diffraction formula, e to the i pi over lambda d, x minus psi squared plus y minus eta squared the psi d eta. So that is the integral that we need to evaluate. So pulling out just the integral in the y dimension over the dummy variable eta, that would be the integral from minus infinity to infinity e to the i pi over lambda z y minus eta squared d eta. And in a previous lecture, when we were deriving the Fresnel formula, we showed that the integral overall from minus infinity to infinity of e to the i pi t squared dt was equal to, or is equal to, the square root of i. And so we can apply this to this integral by making the change of variable. t is equal to eta minus y over the square root of lambda z. And then dt would be d eta over the square root of lambda z, realizing that uh, in this integrand here, y minus eta squared is the same as eta minus y squared because of the square. It doesn't matter which order you put those in. And so if we put that in here, this becomes e to the i pi t squared. And then the d eta becomes dt times the square root of lambda z. And that evaluates then to the square root of lambda z times the square root of i. So the whole thing evaluates to the square root of i lambda z. So that's what we get out of that integral there. Now we have the integral in the x dimension, minus infinity to zero, e to the i pi over lambda z psi minus x squared d psi. So in this case, we're going to define a new variable s, which is the square root of pi over lambda z psi minus x. And by the way, we did the same trick here where we swapped the order in the original Fresnel formula. It was x minus psi squared, and we just turned it around here. It doesn't change the value. Now, uh, we could have used this same kind of approach where we just had 1 over the square root of lambda z, but instead we put this pi in here, and that's because we're going to put it into a form that's more standard in the literature. So with that, we would then have ds would be this factor of square root of pi over lambda z times d psi. Now, 
And with that, this integral then transforms into, well, let's see, for d psi, we would have the inverse of that factor times ds. So let's put the inverse of that factor out in front. That would be lambda z over pi. And then this becomes, well, well, this whole integrand there is just i times the square of this. So this becomes then e to the i s squared. And we already had the ds with that factor there. And that goes from, well, uh, when psi is minus infinity, so is s. So that still goes from minus infinity. But now when psi is 0, s is minus x times square root pi over lambda z. So it's minus x square root of pi over lambda z. Because the integrand is an even function of s, because it depends on s squared, we can rewrite this as the square root lambda z over pi. The integral, instead of from minus infinity to minus x square root pi over lambda z, we can write it as from plus x square root of pi over lambda z to plus infinity e to the i s squared ds and we will call that the square root of lambda z over pi times a function f of u which we'll define in just a minute evaluated at u is equal to x times the square root of pi over lambda z. So basically f of u is going to be this, this integral and u is going to be the lower limit of integration. And now let's make that a little more specific. So we define f of u to be, by definition, the integral from u to infinity e to the i s squared ds. And this is called the complex for now integral. This is not a very convenient form for actual evaluation. First of all, because of the complex uh, integrand and also because of the infinite uh, upper limit of integration, but it can be written as the integral from zero to infinity minus the integral from 0 to u. And this evaluates, well, we know from minus infinity to infinity, this evaluates as the square root of i pi. And so this is half of that. It's a symmetric function, a symmetric integrand. So this is square root of i pi over 2. And this can be broken up into real and imaginary parts. So this will become square root of i pi over 2 minus the integral from 0 to u cosine s squared ds plus i, the integral from 0 to u sine s squared ds, right? This is just rewriting e to the i s squared as cosine s squared plus i sine s squared integrating from 0 to u. So we wrote the integral from u to infinity as the integral from 0 to infinity minus the integral from 0 to u. And now these are just have a finite interval, so they're much more convenient for numerical calculation. And these are called the real Fresnel integrals. This is called c of u, and this one is called s of u. And with that, well, now we have everything uh, we need for our solution. The field, and we're just gonna, not going to write it as g2 of x and y at some distance. Now we're keeping a z in here as an arbitrary distance. So it describes the field everywhere in z greater than 0. It doesn't depend on y because of the uniformity of the geometry in y. So it becomes g of x and z is equal to our standard integral uh, diffraction formula 
factors out in front, e to the i, 2 pi lambda z over i lambda z. And then from the y integration, we had a square root of i lambda z. And then from the x dimension integration, we had a square root of lambda z over pi. And then times this f of u. That's what we had on the previous board there, where u is equal to x times the square root of pi over lambda z. And let's see, there's some cancellation here. We've got square root of lambda z, square root of lambda z, and a lambda z. Those all cancel. Here you've got a square root of i, and here you've got an i. So that just leaves a 1 over the square root of i pi. So we then finally have e to the i 2 pi over lambda z over the square root of i pi times f of u, and where u is given by this parameter here. Now notice that implies that the other than this, uh, this z phase, that the field is constant in amplitude wherever u is constant. Well, that defines a relation between x and z here. That defines the relation that x, then, would be equal to u times the square root of lambda z over pi. So this would define contours where x is proportional to the square root of z. So here is a plot of magnitude f of u over the square root of pi. This is the this represents here the magnitude of g of x z for z greater than zero, where u is equal to x as the square root of pi over lambda z. And as we just stated. That means that this will be constant wherever u is constant, and that will be a contour where x is equal to u times the square root of lambda z over pi. So uh, we've plotted out some of those contours here and normalized everything to the wavelength. So this is z over lambda, x over lambda, or alternately take units in which lambda is equal to 1. And so this is a contour where the magnitude of g is equal to 1. And this is a contour where it's equal to 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 eighth, and 1 sixteenth. And these would just continue on as parabolas facing to the right, so where x is proportional to the square root of z. Um, notice an interesting special case here. When x is equal to 0, then u is always equal to 0 for all z. And for u is equal to 0 right here, we look up here and we find, and if, in fact, it's easy to, to show based on the formulas we had before, uh, that that's where the f of u over square root of pi magnitude is 1 half. So the entire um, uh, plane, x is equal to 0, will always, all the way out to infinity, have an amplitude of one half. Above, the amplitudes will be less, dropping off. But dropping off in, in x, as you increase in x, but if you move farther and farther in z, you've got to go farther and farther in x for those to, to drop off the same amount. And then down below the, uh, the plane defined by x is equal to 0, the amplitude goes up, and there's some little uh, wrinkles out here as you, as you go out in the stronger region of the field. Now, this, as I mentioned, is very important because, theoretically, because we, we can find an exact solution. And the exact solution, well, that Remember, we're doing scalar diffraction theory. We've assumed that the polarization has no effect 
on our calculations. In fact, polarization does have a little bit of an effect, especially when you have a screen and it, it matters whether the incident field is polarized parallel to the edge of the screen or perpendicular. So here's what the exact solution looks like. G of X and Z is equal to one over the square root of I pi, looks familiar, E to the I, two pi over lambda R, not Z, okay? And now in this uh, case, we're looking at a geometry as we sketched on the previous uh, board, where this is X, this is Z, and if this is a point in the plane, this is an angle theta, and this is a distance R. And of course, in the paraxial approximation, R is approximately Z. And then we've got E to the minus I alpha squared, F of alpha, that's the same F function, minus or plus E to the minus I beta squared F of beta, where alpha is the square root, oops, we'll do that again. Alpha is the square root of four pi r over lambda times the sine of theta over two. And notice up here, um, in the paraxial approximation, the small angle approximation. So this would be, that would be X and this would be, this would be Z. Theta is approximately X over Z. And so if you take then that the sine of theta is of theta over two is approximately equal to theta over two. Uh, the one over two would become under the square root, would become a four, get rid of that four. You'd have pi r over lambda. This would be like x over z. And so you'd keep the x outside, and then the 1 over z would come in, become a 1 over z squared. And if r is approximately equal to z, this would be z over z squared. So it would end up being pi over lambda z. And that would be this expression right here. x times square root pi over lambda z. This would be approximately equal to u. And the beta is similar for pi r over lambda cosine of theta over two. And that is the exact solution where the minus sign corresponds to an X polarization. That means that the electric field is polarized in the X dimension and the plus to a Y polarization. So what does this look like, this exact solution? Well, let's look at a comparison between our approximate solution using scalar theory and the paraxial approximation, small angle formulas, and also the Kirchhoff boundary conditions for diffraction by uh, a transmission function for a, a half plane and the exact solutions, which uh, work out precisely the solution to Maxwell's equations. So in this plot, we've got the magnitude of G of X and Z equal to 100 wavelengths, 100 lambda. And our approximate solution we worked out is represented by the open circles. And then the two exact solutions for X polarized and Y polarized uh, incident field are represented by the solid blue curve and the dashed red curve. And this goes from X over lambda from minus 30 to plus 30. And you can see the agreement is excellent. And this gives us a lot of confidence uh, in the theory we have worked out. Yeah. So it gives us confidence in, in both the scalar theory. Now you can see that the, the two exact solutions 
uh, don't exactly agree. There's a slight differences, especially over here, very far into the shadow region, but only slight differences. And that's due to the, the edge effects, the different currents at the edge of the, uh, of the, uh, the boundary of the screen. Um, and that's something we're neglecting in our scalar theory. And the other thing is the Kirchhoff boundary conditions, which uh, allows us to assume that the field immediately after the screen is just simply equal to the transmittance function of the screen times the magnitude of the, of the incident field, the one times the T of X and Y, which is not exactly true, again, because it really does depend. It's, it ties in with also with the effects of polarization. Um, but those approximations have given us excellent agreement with a case where we can calculate the exact solution. So going forward, we can have a lot of confidence in our theory and our theoretical results as long as we stay within the bounds set by um, those that we assumed in applying our approximations.